It's our special two-hour coverage of tonight's CNN Republican presidential town halls with Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley. It continues now. I'm Laura Coates in Washington, D.C. And I'm Abby Phillip in New York. Iowa Republicans are set to vote in just 10 days. And yes, that's how fast it's all moving right now. And tonight, Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley facing some tough questions from those very voters. Questions on hot button issues like the border, the economy, the war in Ukraine, abortion, and both are taking their shots at the candidate you didn't see. I'm talking about frontrunner Donald J. Trump. We're digging into all of it over the next two hours together. So stay with us. We're going to start right here in New York with our great panel on set with me here, Scott Jennings. You're in the hot seat. I want to ask you not just uh, what your takeaways were, but what do you think the strengths were of each of these candidates, Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis? Well, I thought DeSantis delivered one of the best performances I've seen him give in the entire campaign. I think he's really improved over the last several weeks, made no mistakes. It was center-cut conservative content on immigration and uh, other issues. So I thought he had an incredibly strong night. I think on Nikki Haley, where she always shines, head and shoulders above everyone, in my opinion, is on foreign policy. She knocked that topic out of the park. I think for people who have been arguing that they're not hitting Donald Trump hard enough, <laughs> they put that to bed tonight yeah. because I thought both DeSantis and Haley came and, and whacked Donald Trump pretty hard on a number of topics. What I was most surprised at was that they didn't really whack each other. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Uh, I mean, yeah. it, it, uh, DeSantis in particular, it was like, where's this guy been? Uh, it, it, you know, usually he's, he's cold toward uh, uh, the audience and kind of warm toward Donald Trump in this weird way. It was reverse this time. He was warm with the audience. And he was cold-blooded going after Donald Trump. Mm. I'm like, where has this guy been? If this guy had been around for the past couple of months, he might have done something different. Uh, I thought he was... I, I could not understand why anybody thought that the Ron DeSantis we saw in these debates would have ever been anything. Tonight, you understand what the potential was, though I think it's largely been wasted. And Nikki Haley was Nikki Haley. She's always great. Listen, Listen. I, I, Nikki Haley is generally always the smartest person in the room, save for CNN's Erin Burnett, who is there with her. Um, she has a command of the facts, and she always is able to work her biographical experience to show her leadership. When I was at the UN, I was in Gaza. When I was governor, I did X, Y, and Z. She shows that she looks presidential when she talks about serious policy. No, you know, it, it, I would say performance-wise, it probably wasn't her strongest night, but she always wins on the substance. And... Ukraine is going to be a very key issue in this GOP primary. There's a very definitive split. Donald Trump will not continue aid to Ukraine. He is not going to give aid to Zelensky's government. Ron DeSantis gave kind of a vague answer when Caitlin pushed him on it. Nikki Haley was very definitive. She will continue to support Ukraine. On DeSantis, I think it was probably one of his strongest performances. He really honed in on an argument that I think will resonate with voters against Donald Trump, which is to say he made these promises for four years and didn't do them. What I say you could take to the bank and I will do. People will listen to that and I think it'll break through. Yeah, you know, one thing that I think is clear is that uh, campaigning in 99 counties and uh, from morning till night does have a, an effect. And I think what you saw in DeSantis is growth uh, as a performer. Uh, he was not a good performer at the beginning of the campaign, much, much better tonight. And if there are late deciding uh, caucus uh, attendees in Iowa, this is a timely uh, time for it. I, I don't know, when you said he was cold-blooded and going after uh, Trump, he was cool-blooded, I think. <laughs> was, uh, there were, but, there were but, some but, topics <laughs> that he would not address, nor would Haley, for that matter, but uh, and she was as we've come to expect. I mean, she's she's very very um, orderly in her presentation. She always has three or four points. This is what I would do: one, two, three, four, uh, and it uh, and it uh, it projects a kind of command that has uh, helped her in the debates, and I think it helped her uh, tonight. We'll get to some of the. Uh, some of the so cold blooded, cold blooded or cool blooded. Well, but she, she, Hold on, let's 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 play it. Let's roll the tape. Beat, let's beat see him up what he on said. abortion. Beat him up on immigration. <laughs> Go ahead, man. I was, I, was, I was just saying, like I, I was surprised. He basically called him a flip flopper on abortion. Said he was weak and ineffective on immigration. I was like, yeah, this no. this this was tough stuff. Now, to, to your point, he could have gone, gone harder. But before no, no, he was no, hugging no, him like no, a teddy bear no, no. every time. My, my point is this: Yes, he was on those issues. He's not pro. Of course, he's not pro-life. I mean, he took shots that he had, has never taken before, and it's clear that they recognize that they need to get some of these Trump-oriented voters to swing back his way yeah. uh, in 
in this race. My, my point is just whenever he was asked about Trump's conduct uh, relative to January 6th or some of the other issues that yeah. have gotten him into legal issues, he... he, he uh, he, yeah, he, he took a long way around well, and not answering. To answer. Dan's point, though, calling a fellow Republican yeah. not pro-life in Iowa, that's about the meanest thing you could say. <laughs> I would expect the Trump campaign will respond to that very, very quickly. He did, though, take the issue of January 6th. If you listen carefully to what he said about the strategic argument about why we should nominate someone other than Trump, he effectively said that January 6th is going to make it hard for the country to reelect Donald Trump as president. He, and so if you if you really wanted to parse it out, he he went there on that topic. He didn't say it as blatantly as as uh, perhaps some uh, people who care about that issue a lot want him to, but the argument was clear. Uh, the Democrats are going to wrap this around Donald Trump's neck and it will prevent him from being president. I, I thought it was interesting the way he did it though. He said, "You know, you've going to you have this left-wing democratic jury, 12 jurors, <laughs> you know." <laughs> so he basically and at once embraced the idea that Trump was being persecuted and at the same time said, but this is a liability. Mm. Uh, when he was asked about a second Trump term, he said, uh, uh, well, you saw what happened in the midterm elections. We did terribly. It's going to be bad for Republicans. But he never said what the second term would be like in terms of the lives of the American and, well, people. And on Nikki Haley, I mean, she she actually went down the same road on Trump, basically saying he comes with all this baggage. He's too emotional. It's going to be too difficult for him to govern without coming with all this other stuff that's not so great. They're both working in the same lane here. They are working in the same lane, and they're still towing a line. But I did think an interesting line from Nikki Haley was when she said, I used to tell Donald Trump, you are your own worst enemy, reminding people she was a presidential advisor to him as U.N. ambassador, somebody that he handpicked to be in that role and who did speak truth to him about his own actions or his shortcomings. I thought that was a powerful moment that will resonate with some folks. But again, there is a limit to how far there any either of these two are going to go in actually criticizing Donald Trump. And I think today was the furthest we've seen them go. All right, let's let's listen to what you're just talking about there. I personally think President Trump was the right president at the right time. I agree with a lot of his policies. But the reality is, rightly or wrongly, chaos follows him. And we all know that's true. Chaos follows him. And we can't have a country in disarray and a world on fire and go through four more years of chaos. We won't survive it. Four more years of chaos. That's probably the toughest I've heard her describe the Trump era. Chaos, Candid. And, and uh, if, if you keep going on, she talks about uh, no more drama. He's getting in his feelings. I mean, this was, a, I mean, this was she actually... Used I mean, she said, no more drama. I mean, He's getting in your she's, feelings. She has been, she has been saying this... Uh, yeah. Uh, right along. You know, yeah. one of the interesting things, just getting back to DeSantis for a second, mm -hmm. uh, one of his, you know, he said, we need uh, a change agent, essentially. And wise, I think they were almost those words. Uh, and uh, you have to wonder whether people really look at these guys and say, yeah, he's a change agent, Trump is. And he's trying to make a difficult argument, which is, I can deliver on the things that Trump promised. But Honestly, if you did a poll and you asked people who is more likely to bring about change, DeSantis or Trump, my guess is Trump would win that going away because he's seen as a wrecking ball.